Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's exactly the type of uh, feedback I like to hear. <laughs> yeah. So um, I want to admit um, everyone into the room, so I do a very quick introduction. Yep, go for it. Go for it. That's fine. All right, great. So let me admit everyone. I'm doing that right now. So I've started recording, so we'll be live in a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, still waiting for others to join in. So we have a lot of people entering to the room right now. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, it's really, really good to be here. Thank you so much for being part of this. Um, just want to say you're welcome. And uh, we'll start shortly. So as you can see, our guest is here. He's prepared. He's waiting for everyone. So I can't wait. Hi, Harry. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Hey, Hello, thank you for having Rachel. me. Rachel says good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. Yeah, happy Monday. Happy Monday. You know, um, uh, how are we dealing with the lockdown and everything? So please, um, just a few um, announcements before we begin. Um, please, as much as possible, try to mute your mics um, so that we don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, you know, distractions um, so that we can have a seamless webinar, all right? Then also, please feel free to use the chat function at any time. Um, I believe Harry is here for us, so he'll be able to answer whatever questions you have. And so without that, um, Harry, I don't know if this is a good place to start. Sure, yeah, no, so thanks so much for having me. It's, um, it's great to kind of have everyone here. I, for those of you who don't know, I'm based in the UK. My name is Harry. I'm a future trainee solicitor at Baker McKenzie, which is a law firm over in London. Um, and I'm currently studying at law school. Uh, it's called the LPC, um, and about to finish that um, towards the end of this month. So um, I'm looking to start uh, practicing in September and went through the application process to get that training contract, which is sort of like an internship for a job, um, a year or two ago. And for about the last 12 months or so, I've been interviewing recruiters, I've been speaking to other students, I've been creating resources, guides, um, podcasts, and so on, all designed to try and help kind of aspiring lawyers learn a little bit more about law and kind of how to break into the profession. So um, yeah, that, that was kind of, I guess, the basis of how Rosemont and I got in touch um, to organize this. Um, and yeah, really kind of happy to try and help answer any of your guys' questions and to um, yeah, hopefully help you learn a little bit more about law and kind of what, what it is I do and anything else you might want to ask me on the on the content side of things as well. Okay, that's quite amazing. So there's a tradition we usually do. Um, so when we have very good guests or we have guests coming up, we love to read your profile. So we just love to do that mm -hmm. because I think your profile itself is an inspiration to basically allow a lot of people basically see the trajectory of your growth and how you've been able to actually use where you are to get to where you want to be. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, so, um, so Harry Clark is a young yet astute and innovative law graduate and future trainee of Baker McKenzie, who has garnered a vast array of working experience from high street law practice, to pro bono work, even gaining said for international scholarships and multinational corporate firms like DLA Piper, QLO, amongst others. With a passion for improving access to the legal profession and helping aspiring lawyers learn about law, in global context, he founded the More From Law podcast series, um, which covers latest development in the legal industry with a variety of interviews, deep dive analysis, commentary, and discussion to broaden the listener's legal horizon. All right, and this is not just cool. Um, Harry Clark has published several enlightening resources for aspiring and even practicing lawyers. Some of these publications and podcasts are on topics such as commercial awareness, how to nail your digital first impression on LinkedIn, how to get better at negotiating, mental health, inspiring change, the logo profession, application and preparation tips for landing internship training contracts, among several other publications. He's easily accessible on his handle at Harry Clark Law, Twitter, Instagram, and also his website is harryclarklaw.com. So Harry, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for being part of this. And um, I am so excited to learn so many things that you have to share because a brief, a brief background now. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you everyone joining me from different parts of the world. So um, I know that we have Nigerians on the call, which is my own country. Hi, people. Um, we have people from different countries, India, Australia, Germany. I can see some from Berlin. I can see someone from 
too many countries. So I really, really acknowledge the time and I'm pretty sure that we're in different time zones. So you actually being here means a lot to us, means a lot to me. So thank you so much. And we really, really hope, I'm, I am actually sure that you're going to have an amazing time, all right? So Harry, how does it feel to be on the other side? Because um, on your podcast and, you know, when you're giving content, most times you are on the asking side, not actually <laughs> on the receiving side. <laughs> so how does it actually feel to be on the other side and you're the one that is now being asked questions and you have to answer? Just a brief answer. Yeah, it's good fun. So, so I kind of was fortunate enough to kind of be on a number of podcasts and webinars, answering questions and kind of being on part of panels and even attending them um, like you guys are today. Um, and it was kind of through doing that, that the idea of actually hosting something and kind of being able to ask questions, give it your own kind of creative directional input was, um, was really interesting. So it's been really good fun. Um, I think to date, I think over the last like month or so, the show has had a really big kind of up, uptick in people listening, which is great. Um, and, but no, it's been really good, good fun. Well, the good thing about podcasts and webinars and, and live streams and all that stuff is you can really add your own kind of take on it um, and make it really personal and make it niche about whatever it is that you're interested in. So if you're looking to learn more about anything, I think podcasts are a really great way to do that because they they can be so sort of specific on a certain area or whatever. Um, but no, it's yeah. been really good fun. It's, I've enjoyed it. All right, that's amazing. So let's just have a little bit of background. So how has your trajectory been from getting into law, choosing to actually go on with a law degree and actually coming to this point where you are so certain of what exactly you wanted to do, which made you to actually launch a podcast, you know, generate a lot of value <clears throat> and actually give that kind of value. So what was your journey like and what was the turning point for you that made you certain that you were actually on the right path? Yeah, so that's a kind of really common interview question that I think you'll get as a candidate, that kind of why law, why commercial law, whatever. Um, and I guess for me, when I was probably about 16 or so, when I was at secondary school, um, I was studying a lot of kind of essay style subjects. So English, history, politics, um, a lot of the kind of argumentative writing style and things really kind of appealed to me. Um, and when I was 16, I was I emailed sort of local firms around me. I went on Google Maps and kind of asked family members if they knew anyone and, and kind of looked up local firms around me and emailed them basically saying, is there anyone I can speak to? Could I just kind of shadow you for a week and just kind of see what you do on a on a day to day basis? Um, and through doing that, I was really I was really fortunate to get sort of two opportunities. So I spent a week at a family law practice um, on my local high street. Um, and uh, that was really, really interesting. That was the first time I actually saw what lawyers did, you know, in practice, or at least a sort of certain type of lawyer. Um, and whilst, you know, all of the kind of client facing stuff, the kind of problem solving skills you're doing, all of the reading and the kind of, um, critical thinking you're doing was really interesting. Um, to me, the kind of the, the area of family law and kind of wills and probate was very emotionally intensive, um, as you can probably imagine. And so, um, when I went into the second week, which was to do with more kind of commercial corporate stuff, um, I had more of an interest in just the business world anyway. Um, and I think it was when the turning point, I guess, for me, like you said, was I was kind of working with this solicitor and we were working on a contract that was in two languages. It was part Russian, it was part English, and it was to do with a delivery from of printers from like Eastern Asia to the UK or something like that. Um, and we were being tasked with trying to kind of solve this dispute between these two companies that were based all over the world. And I think it was just the idea that, you know, you could be sat at a desk in a, in a small town in one country and, you know, that this legal problem spans all over the globe um, and uh, is kind of really interesting. Yeah. So I think that was the first time I kind of thought I really like this idea of business law. And also I really like that international kind of aspect to it uh, as, as well. Yeah. And then um, I think after that, I, I kind of realized I wanted to do that kind of commercial law of an international sphere. So whilst I was at university studying law, like you said, I kind of went down at that route. Um, I started to research more about firms that had either multiple offices around the world or they worked with clients who were from all over the world so that I could hopefully do that um, when I worked there. Um, and then I did sort of three rounds of applications over the course of two years. And in my third and final round, I was successful in, in getting a, a sort of internship with with Baker McKenzie, who are an international firm. And then since then, um, like you said, the idea of kind of the idea of um, making things and, and giving back value and so on, um, it was a total accident actually. So I was, I was on my phone and I was looking for um, some space to clear on my phone because it was quite full and I was trying to download something else. 
and I saw LinkedIn and I hadn't used LinkedIn for the best part of two years. And even when I say used it, it was more of just a, a digital CV. You know, I just kind of kept updating my experience and what I was doing now and then, but I never really kind of actually used it as a platform. Um, and that was, it was at a time of year when a lot of people were posting about, oh, I've managed to secure this job I just secured this application I just secured this interview um, and I just kind of remembered that you know not too long ago I was in the position where I didn't have any of that and I know how easy it is um, as a candidate who's applying to look at the state of social media and whatever on posts and kind of yeah. view that as the as a true and fair representation as, as what as to what people are doing and, and, and how they're getting on so um, I made a little post about that it resonated with people and then from there, just kind of not having a concrete solid plan, um, ended up kind of uh, <laughs> making my own blog. And then when that kind of got some traction, yeah. ended up making my own podcast. And yeah, no, it's just been really, really fun. I'm coming up to about a year of doing that now. Um, and yeah, no, that's that's kind of my journey in 60 seconds or so. Oh, <laughs> that's really great. So what I can actually see was that, well, you didn't really figure, you didn't, didn't have it all figured out at the beginning. No. But you just took it one step at the other. You started with, okay, what do I have around me? Went to the, you know, a firm close to where you were. Tried to look at what you wanted. And then, of course, you were exposed to something that you actually love to do. And mm. then that actually gave you exposure and then you were able to do other things. That's really, really amazing. And what I can actually get from what you said is basically start from where you are. And mm. so if you're trying to understand, you know, clarity is actually a journey. So um, before you decide that this is what I want you need to actually give yourself the time to be exposed to all sorts of things so that you know what works for you and what doesn't. Thank you very much for that answer. So I will just go straight to the questions. And mm -hmm. please, everyone, um, if you have a question, feel free to just do the chat function. We definitely address them. All right, so my first question to you is, okay, so coming from where you're coming from, um, what would be your advice um, to legal professionals that are seeking to actually expand their scope of practice, particularly internationally or on a global scale. So what would be your advice to legal professionals that are trying to do that? Yeah, so I think I think it's really important, like you say, to kind of have a a kind of global context to your understanding of law and um, you know everything that's going on, especially if you're practicing in the world of business. Um, you know, so many companies nowadays are not just practicing in one country, they're practicing in several. Um, and even if you don't practice with those kind of companies now it's very likely that in future you might be able to so certainly i think it's important to kind of keep up to date with world events mm -hmm. because um you know something that happens on the other side of the world can quite easily impact something that's coming on your country um i think coronavirus was probably a good good example of that of everything that's kind of going on so um in terms of the best yeah. ways for doing that so i think um i think when you first get started trying to follow the news trying to learn more about law or whatever profession you're in um it's very kind of easy to focus in on and this is something i used to do as well it's very easy to kind of focus in on things that you're already somewhat familiar with so i was already quite familiar with a little bit about the world of business i quite liked certain industries like technology and so whenever i was trying to learn more about the law um i'd kind of uh, sort of forced myself un unconsciously to focus on those areas and it was only when i um started to try to kind of network a bit more publicly and write more publicly i realized you know this small percentage of law that i thought was you know significant is actually just a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of stuff that's out there so um i think certainly trying to to network and try to speak to other professionals is really important that doesn't necessarily mean in person um i think if i if linkedin was where it was now when i got started back in when i was you know 16 yeah. six years ago um i really really would have leveraged that and you know the great thing about linkedin is it's a platform designed and built for business professionals and working professionals yes. um, and you can you can meet people from all over the world from from your bedroom so when, when I first got started yeah. with writing my blog I don't think I I left the house for a, for a professional reason to go network uh, until at least I'd been doing it for three months and I was still able to speak to people from Canada America in Europe just by trying to be proactive and, and put myself out there. So yeah. that's certainly one thing I do is network and try to meet with other people. Um, and then the second would be try to learn more about other industries and other 
countries, mm. other, other jurisdictions, which um, might not be identical to the one you're currently practicing, but certainly supplement it in some way. So um, if you think about law, for example, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to just speak to lawyers and speak to law firms. But, um, you know, there's an element of salesmanship in law. You have to keep your clients happy. You have mm. to always try to market your services. Yeah. You have to advertise what you're doing. So, you know, learn a bit about the world of marketing or, you know, think about the world of finance. Think about how these firms, you know, generate business and make money and make profit. Um, um, if you do that, you'll go from just being that kind of um, what, what's called a sort of backroom lawyer, someone who's really good at the kind of letter of the law knowledge and just focused on the books to more of a kind of front of house yeah. lawyer, someone who is you know, able to go to events and speak publicly and, you know, hopefully try to win yeah. business from clients, as well as having that kind of letter of the law knowledge that you might have um, if you've studied mm -hmm. it elsewhere. That's amazing. All right, that's great because some of the things you've been able to say, I can attach to the fact that law in itself is a business. Mm -hmm. So apart from just trying to learn things on the back end, first of all, understand that there is a global context to what you're doing. So follow the news, mm -hmm. um, leverage social media platforms, um, be proactive, put yourself out there. You know, um, in the jurisdiction I find myself, which is Nigeria, um, we have rules that basically you know, try to limit the way we advertise. So we may not be able to advertise like Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Mm -hmm. But by giving value, you know, uh, by basically, you know, offering very, very qualitative services, there is no way your name is going to be actually spread and people can actually come to know exactly what you're doing. So don't say that, oh, my knowledge of the law is enough. You must understand that law in itself is a business. And so you must actually position yourself properly to actually gain and attract opportunities. So the truth mm -hmm. is, if you hadn't put yourself out there, there is no way I would have come across your work. I would have mm -hmm. been so impressed and would not have been having to discuss this conversation. Mm -hmm. Imagine if I was a client looking for somebody to advise me on commercial awareness, what would happen? I would be the first person I would come to. So that's <laughs> very, very profound. And I really think it's something that we should actually pay attention to, mm -hmm. you know, and just not limiting yourself to your jurisdiction, whatever it is. So thank mm -hmm. you for that answer. No so for a lawyer that is really seeking to join, you know, the big firm, DLA Pipers, Key Law, Baker McKenzie from Trend Institution, you know, what are some of the key things that actually have to be in place so that you can be ready um, to take advantage of those opportunities whenever they show themselves? What should I do? Let's say I'm from Nigeria now. If I want mm -hmm. to be or partake in such firms and such organizational practices, you know, what exactly are the things that I should begin to put in place you know, to get ready for those opportunities? Sure. Yeah. So um, I think there's a number of kind of misconceptions and, and mistakes that people tend to have about this. So, um, you know, for starters, um, legal experience is obviously great, um, but it's not, necess it's not necessarily a, you know, a prerequisite or you, you must have it in order to practice. There are people in my cohort or people I know who are currently practicing law who didn't have any kind of legal experience before they entered profession. Um, and instead, and this is what I kind of recommend candidates do regardless of what type of experience they have, I think is try to evidence the type of skills and the type of mindset um, that the firm will be looking for. So um, you mentioned one of them, commercial awareness is obviously a really key skill, basically keeping up to date with the world and be, being able to put a client's needs in context. Um, others include like business development, the ability to go out and win new clients, um, critical thinking, being able to kind of evaluate the way that you, you currently do things and criticize and try to improve the kind of methods that you used to do things. Those are all a few examples of the different types of skills that um, that lawyers will, will will inevitably need at some point in their career, um, and so I think from the from the experience and the skill side of things, those are those are kind of good ways to do it. Try to think about what the firm is is kind of looking for and demonstrate, you know, not just what your responsibilities were when you were working in a certain role, but where possible, where you kind of went above and beyond that, and you you kind of demonstrated your own real kind of personal impact. Um, and then I guess the second side to things is is the idea of sort of your motivations. So you asked at the beginning about why law um, and you know I think hopefully in my answer you can kind of tell what I did was to sort of start with that really big broad question of why law um, and then kind of take the recruiter through um, that journey that kind of that timeline of how my things developed over time and um, eventually what you'll notice is that question sort of begins to narrow and narrow and narrow over time um, yeah. until you hopefully reach that 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 specific firm that you're applying to so um, you know start with that really broad question of why law go on to another section of it, you know, why commercial law, for instance, reflect on how, um, you know, even things that aren't related to commercial law, like family law practice, what didn't, didn't I like about those different areas? Um, how did that then lead me on to my next step to then apply for this or learn more about this? Um, and then eventually what you'll hopefully do is, is the more you kind of go through that process, you'll eventually reach 
or help the recruiter reach the conclusion of you, you applying to that firm. Um, so that's kind of like the funneling process as well. And then finally, um, I think it's re one of the key things I did. So, so I, I did three rounds of applications. So I applied three separate times for different firms. Um, and, and certainly between my second and my third round, um, my, my academics and my skills and my experience didn't change that much. Um, but what did change was, was my kind of approach to applications. So um, I spent a lot of time researching the firm, trying to learn more about what are their unique selling points? What are their cultures like? What, what, what kind of clients do they work with? Um, and not just so that I would then just kind of reuse that application, that information on application. You know, it's no good just telling a firm something they already know about themselves, but instead saying, yeah. okay, I see that you've done this and that really relates to me because of x and i can evidence that because of this experience i've done and so on so you're kind of using the information about the firm but then relating it to your own experiences when you're when you're trying to kind of describe describe it to the firm um and i think just as a kind of general last point on applications um it's also really really important to tailor them so in my first round of applications i kind of had this idea to write out a I guess a template you would call it a sort of stock answer and sort of copy and paste it and not really change much of the words here or there only really changing the names of the firm um, and it's no surprise that every single one of them got rejected because um, when you're applying to these firms you need to make sure that your writing style is really specific you need to kind of show that you've done your research um, you know a good test is that you shouldn't be able to change the name of the firm in your application and it still makes sense and you should you should kind of have enough specificity specificity to do that um, and I think if you can if your application can pass that test and you can go back and look at your old ones and reflect on them and try to review where they went wrong um, that's hopefully going to, to kind of help your applications improve and, and like you say land, land some kind of opportunity down the line okay that's great so you've mentioned okay you have to study the firm okay so um, we have somebody who actually made a comment and it was in relation to your last answer mm -hmm. which I just want to stay but so far, so good. Um, basically, you've mentioned very, very key and important things that we actually have to take you know, into mind, like studying the firm, critical thinking, no copy and paste approach because each firm is different. Mm -hmm. You know, um, different firms operate differently. And then, of course, being able to know your own story, own your own story, own your own reason why you are basically doing what it is, whatever you're doing, you know, why that firm, why do you want to engage you? Know, with that firm. So I'm going to read a couple of comments and um, I think this will help us. Okay. Um, so um, from Johnny, uh, Johnny says, hi, Harry, you've mentioned the importance of taking the recruiter through a story, starting with why law and later why commercial law. I often feel that I do not have a compelling turning point. How should I go about this process of crafting this narrative? Do you have any tips for how I could really introspectively reflect on my own journey to help me create such a story. So thank you, Johnny. That was a very, very good question. Yeah, no, good question. Um, so obviously you'd only say why commercial law if you're interested in that, but I'll assume um, for the sake of your question that you are. So, um, you know, I don't think it is, I don't think it's necessary that you kind of have this, this big eureka moment where everything fits into place. I don't, I think it's quite rare for anyone to kind of have that when they're thinking about a career. Um, but hopefully if you kind of, you know, take a copy of your resume or your CV or whatever it is, and you've got those list of experiences, um, you know, a, a good exercise would be to kind of take two different colored pens and, and next to each one, write down all the different things that you really liked about that experience when you did it. Um, and, you know, ignoring kind of what you later did back down the line at that moment in time, what did you really like when you did that? And then with another pen say, that's what I didn't like. And, and hopefully for each of those experiences, you'll, you'll have at least a mix of two. Um, which then means, you know, when you're talking about experiences which don't necessarily sound as though they relate a lot to to law. So, for example, I was working in retail in a shop, for example, um, just the idea of kind of helping people and, and customer service and being able to, you know, um, I don't know, someone comes in and they're, they're buying something for dinner and trying to help them pick out a wine or just trying to kind of go, go a bit more. I really kind of found satisfaction in, 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 you know, that person coming back the next week and saying, oh, that was really nice. And I, you know, did this or whatever. So, you know, that idea of kind of customer service and I guess what you would call client satisfaction, um, you know, does slot alongside the law. And that's an example of kind of reflecting on an experience that doesn't necessarily relate to commercial law um, in a way which will, for example, which will, um, kind of help you build that story and then I guess when it comes to kind of the idea of 
crafting this narrative, like you say. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, don't don't write about something that's not true. I mean, make sure you are genuinely interested. But I guess in terms of putting those pieces together, um, you know, you should hopefully pick out the sort of a number of those key experiences. Um, key because they have kind of had the most significant um kind of change in your perspective on what law was about so kind of doing that pen exercise um it could be that um you know once you tried one thing you decided that it definitely wasn't for you and you've never done anything in that realm since and you can kind of reflect on that fact and hopefully change it that way um you could look through your experiences think about the ones which the recruiters might find the most interesting or the most impressive and kind of use those to yeah. both tell about your story and also evidence your skill set um and then yeah like like we kind of said you kind of start with that broader question and then just begin to narrow so you go so for in my example um why law why commercial law why commercial law with an international element and then even narrower why mm -hmm. commercial law with an international element that also had the opportunity for me to work abroad when i worked there and and the more you do that um the more you will kind of narrow down the the kind of list of firms that that you think will suit you yeah and that you would apply for. I hope that answers your question. Yes, all right, great. That's amazing. Um, I can relate to what you've said, particularly to when maybe you are applying for maybe your master's or a PhD, and then you are told to actually write a purpose statement. Mm. Now, what is the school looking for? They're basically looking for your story. You having to own the reason why you want to actually want to commit to studying this particular course. And it's something that you should actually ask yourself. Now, most firms um, maybe here may not say, okay, if they say, tell me a little bit of yourself, of course, you will not begin to say things that you cannot relate specifically to the goal you are trying to achieve and trying to, you know, get, you know, um, intent or maybe get a job in that firm. So like you said, you should basically own your story and narrow it down. You know, you should be able to break your story to something that a six-year-old will understand because simplicity is very, very key. You can be simple, you can be direct, and you can be on point. Maybe things will get heard better or you'll be understood better. So that actually works. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to take one more question. So we have somebody and I believe um, this question will be it's quite key. Um, so I'm trying to read it. So he says, um, good morning, sir. So great to have you this morning. I'm sure he's great to be here too. Um, I'm a final year student of law looking to graduate very soon. My question is, how does taking virtual internships help my chances in getting other international opportunities? like international clerkships, vacation schemes, and tips on how to create a good presence on LinkedIn. So this question is from Babatunde Shobayo. Oh, great. And uh, nice to meet you as well. <laughs> good, good to have you here um, this morning. So I think that question's in two parts. So for the first part yes. on the kind of virtual internship side of things. So um, mm -hmm. it, I actually didn't discover virtual internships until after I'd kind of secured my um, my, my training contract. But um, they're certainly a really, really invaluable way to learn about what lawyers do um, and get an insight into that type of firm. So, um, you know, that they're freely available you can sign up you don't even have to do law firm virtual in internships you can do them at marketing accounting accountancy firms mm -hmm. consulting firms and so on um but personally i think what they really kind of serve as is a really good kind of first base for you to learn more about what lawyers do so um you know go into one of these virtual internships with an open mind um have a go at kind of some of the tasks that trainees do for example or that that, that kind of firms offer for their junior level um staff and use that as a kind of uh on the basis to say, okay, I liked doing this little bit, but I didn't quite doing this bit for whatever reason. Um, you know, learn a little bit more about practice areas, all the different ways that this this big umbrella term of commercial law is kind of broken up into intellectual property, into disputes, litigation, banking, finance. You know, there's so many different areas of law within within the commercial side of things. So I think the virtual internships are a really good way for you to gather a bit more information and to learn about it. Um, and also they're just a good show of enthusiasm. I think if you apply to a firm and say that you've done a virtual internship there, it shows that you're really interested in that firm. Um, yeah. And I yeah. think that, um, yeah, again, it comes down to how you kind of use that to you know, demonstrate your motivations and demonstrate your skills that you're, you're trying to prove to the firm. So they're certainly really useful and a really good starting point. So um, I don't think you really have anything to lose by doing them. I think, I think they're a great resource to hopefully learn a little bit more. And then in terms of LinkedIn, yeah. um, I think, yeah, so, so 
I think, um, you know, you have to get the basics right first. So get a good photo, um, you know, use your cover photo, make it sound a bit bright, go through your entire profile. LinkedIn will help you do this. I think it's on the um, ad profile section, whatever on, on your actual profile. profile. It, it kind of goes through each stage of your profile for you and helps you to make sure everything's filled out. So definitely do that. Um, and then when it comes to actually, you know, talking about your experiences, for example, in, in the kind of job section, um, I think it goes back to that point that we mentioned um, earlier on, which is, you know, give a short introduction as to what your role was, but then also critically demonstrate how you went above and beyond it where possible and kind of what your personal impact was. So, you know, mm. what changed from day one to the day that you left as a result of you being there? You know, if you're working in a shop, did you have customers tell you that you were you know, able to help them with this, certain things the same ways? Did you win employee of the month if that exists? Did you help kind of improve sales in some way? Um, were you responsible for managing something? Um, you know, I think those are kind of good, good ideas as to how to um, kind of leverage your experiences. And then I guess um, the next important thing is the about section. So again, going back to the idea of kind of telling your story like we did earlier, that, that kind of about section in your bio um, is kind of a sort of chance for you to spend 60 seconds kind of giving an elevator pitch as to who you are, what you've done, what you can do and what you're looking for um, and, and, and give a little bit of personality when you're doing it. So certainly when it comes to kind of the basics of your LinkedIn profile, I think that's how you kind of go about setting it up. Um, and then in terms of driving engagement and trying to hopefully build more, more connections and networks and yeah, things, yeah. I, think it, I think it comes down to two things. So um, the first is, you know, you don't necessarily have to actually produce content and, and, and write posts and, and whatever, but certainly engage with it. So, you know, like other people's statuses, comment your thoughts, on things you know ask yeah. them questions engage with what they're doing and join the discussion and um, that's a really good way to get your profile out there a little bit um and then mm -hmm. secondly um when it comes to uh trying to actually connect with people um you know send personalized connection requests don't just kind of send off a hundred if you're really if you yeah, really yeah, want to connect with yeah, that yeah. person um and you really want to get something out of it give a short info say hi you know my name is this i'm looking to then a bit more about that. I saw that you've been doing this recently. Would it be possible to connect and ask you something or would it be possible to connect and meet for coffee or whatever? I think, um, you know, don't, don't expect the best results if you just send blank connection requests. You can get them and they're certainly useful if you're just kind of somewhat interested. But if you're looking to really kind of um, make a genuine connection with someone um, and tailor your request because it will stand out. I hope that's kind of a good 30 seconds on, on LinkedIn as well. All right. Okay, that's great. Uh, okay, so for, for this this question also, I also have something to say. So um, I realized that InsideShepherd.com is an amazing uh, platform where you have a lot of law firms that basically communicate together to begin to you know, provide virtual internship services. So from different platforms, from law to different areas, you know, um, I currently engaged in the virtual program by Latham and Watkins. So I was involved in a couple of major and acquisition transactions, um, proofreading smart contracts. So I literally gained knowledge in things that ordinarily I would not have been able to if I didn't have these platforms available. And how did I get to know about them? LinkedIn. So LinkedIn, beyond just being a place where you swipe and you know, like and comment, you actually keep your eye for what exactly you're looking for. Because when I see someone post like, oh, I just recently completed this virtual stuff, and I don't just like and go, you know, I look at, I try to engage with the content, see how the person went about it, maybe even sending a personal message. And like you said in your profile, you don't bite. So the worst you will get is no response or a no. So, you know, nobody is actually going to give you any trouble. So it's one of the things that I actually found very, very beneficial. And I cannot even begin to imagine the experiences and the, the opportunities that have come as a result of engaging in doing such a virtual internship, even during this lockdown period, mm -hmm. you know, so really, really amazing. And for LinkedIn as well, you've mentioned engaging. So I know how, how I met you, you know, um, I was actually encouraged by the last statement I did not buy. So I said, yes, I know he would respond and I'm so glad <laughs> he did. And so it's one of the ways to actually, you know, meet people, which is really, really quite amazing. So thank you very much for that answer. And so please, guys, please keep your questions coming. I'm very, very sure we'll be able to you know, attend to everything. But because of time, we may not be able to do that. Now to my favorite question. So now um, you talk about commercial awareness. Um, I've read your book, uh, your ebook on commercial awareness, and it is, I think it was one of the most detailed and most explanatory things, you know, I saw in relating to how to actually think as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. You know, there are so many things we mentioned. And for those of you who are attending this webinar, um, after this, I will definitely send you a copy. I believe it's free, so it's something I can send to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Go. Okay. All right. Um, so you, you spoke about the different that what, what commercial awareness is, what mm -hmm. it's not. Um, internal commercial awareness that is you in relation to your firm and external commercial awareness and you have so many podcasts so many you know publications on it so for those for the benefit of those that that don't may not have an understanding of what it is or what how important it is you know what exactly is commercial awareness and mm -hmm. how important is it for lawyers who wish to be relevant you know in global scheme of things Mm. So it's especially if you're going to practice in the business world, um, you know, it might be less so if you're a human rights lawyer, for example, or, or family lawyer, but certainly in the business world, commercial awareness is, is really important. Um, I think a lot of people struggle to define it because you can read a lot about it and everyone kind of has different definitions. I think the, the absolute simplest way I can think about it is basically a client comes to you with a problem and you are putting that client into context so you're thinking about what what industry is that client based in um you know what's their time or budget for this particular problem um why are they looking to do this legal transaction be it are they looking to open new business they're looking to buy another what what's the underlying reasons behind that that all comes under this idea of context and um that context is really really important because it can change the way that you give your legal advice so um, one of the kind of things that I try to, to kind of write about is this idea of there being a kind of two stage process whenever you give legal advice. So, you know, client comes to you with a problem, you go away, you do your research and, um, you know, you look at the law and, you know, it turns out that you've got three options, you know, X, Y and Z. And these are the kind of this is what's legally possible for your client in this scenario. Um, however, if you take that client into context, like I said, you consider their industry, you consider their time, you consider their yeah. budgets, you kind of, um, you know, add that level of commerciality. Um, it might be that, you know, option two is actually better than option three because, you know, there's there's the element of time and they need this done quickly or, um, you know, option one is actually the best bet because um, based on their previous track records of deals and transactions, um, they don't want to make this mistake again, for example. So it's, it's sort of the role of the lawyer not to find a perfect solution to a problem because there really is one, but instead to go away, do their research and then present their findings to the client and say, look, these are all the different options, you know, this one is probably best if you want to do something that's very low risk. This one is probably best if you want something done really quickly and cheaply. This one's best if you want to make sure, you know, all your bases are covered, it'll be more expensive. You're sort of giving the client all these different options and weighing up the pros and cons to both and then allowing the client to then make the decision as to how they want to proceed. So um, lawyers are not just people who regurgitate, you know, statute and just constantly just repeat the law um, and, and what the law says, but instead they're kind of that, that advisor who helps the client go through their problem um, and, and hopefully help them reach a, a good conclusion. So that's kind of what commercial awareness is to me and why it's so important. Um, because I think um, if you don't have it and you, you kind of give your advice without that context or without that awareness of what's going on around you um in the business world at least um you know it's very likely your advice could be outdated it could be wrong yeah. it could be totally ignoring the fact that the client doesn't have a lot of money or you know has done something very similar previously so yeah i think that's kind of what it is and why it's important really okay that's great um i'm going to be quoting a statement by um, jeremy gromfield who you referred mm -hmm. to in yeah that's a good one awareness you know, yes, where he worked as a lawyer before joining the Australian startup uh, Inside Shepherd. Mm -hmm. So he says, something that no one tells you at law school. Clients don't really care about legal information. They really don't. They don't want the lawyer to just tell them legal information. If they did, they would easily look it up on Google themselves. Mm -hmm. What clients want is a trusted advisor. They don't want you to rattle off pieces of legislation and names of cases. They want commercial concise advice. Okay, so basically, you need to, as a lawyer, step into their world, understand the business that they do, and don't just think from an adversarial point of view and say, okay, this is what the law is. So you need to understand how the law basically relates to them, and you can be able to you know, give the advice that they actually require. Okay, so I'm going to ask like a second question out of this. Um, mm -hmm. Internal uh, commercial awareness and external commercial awareness. So what is internal commercial awareness? What is external commercial awareness? So what we just discussed, is it internal or external? And there is a difference between both, if any. 
Yeah, so, so I made I decided to break it down into two areas um, because I think that there's one which is kind of more heavily understood and kind of emphasized um, whenever people discuss it. Um, so, you know, firstly, there's this idea of external commercial awareness, like you say, and, and for the most part, that involves, um, you know, understanding the business world and, you know, understanding what's going on in the news, um, keeping up to date with commercial stories, for example, everything that's kind of going on outside the firm and that you can hopefully relate it to, to your practice and that way um which is what, sort of what we discussed and then there's also these this idea of internal commercial awareness which goes back to the kind of the the thoughts about um critical thinking and business development like we mentioned earlier so how does the firm you're working for work as a business how do they how do they make money how do they generate profit and how do you as a junior lawyer play play your role in doing that so um you know a piece of work comes on your desk and it's your job to review that contract and make sure there's no mistakes that contract then gets passed up to someone who's more senior than you um and is able to i don't know review something else about it or improve it on it in some way and pass it on to the client so um if you think about it law firms are just this big machine and um and i Sorry. guess that that's okay <laughs> that's fine uh, um, um, law firms things. just this kind of big big machine made up of lots of different pieces um and and I guess internal commercial awareness is understanding how you fit into that picture and how you kind of contribute towards it. Okay, that's that's really great. So there's some things you've mentioned um, and it's really, really good because you know you must both be internally commercial aware and of course you give an exercise in finding your fit, mm -hmm. you know, being able to actually know the difference. And of course, no, now for you know internal commercial awareness, talking about client relationships. So um, you're talking about your suppliers, your career pathways, what's the firm's work culture, mm -hmm. you know, um, the technology, how does technology play a role, you know, in the firm and being able to actually participate as well. And then, of course, there's also something you also mentioned. I may be giving a lot of tips away, but I want you <laughs> to funny. actually read this book because I think it's gold because it, when I read it, I was, I was so blown away. So you talk about the SWOT and pestle approach. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's so amazing in understanding basically, you know, um, how to actually, so for example, you're giving a question and you actually use the example of Brexit and how it basically affects your firm and mm -hmm. how it affects your client. So you're talking about how it affects your client externally and how it affects your firm internally. And, you know, so you use the SWOT approach, which is basically your strength. So I wanted to explain what exactly. So if I say okay, this is SWOT approach, I'm like, okay, what is that? So yeah. can you please just really, really explain to us briefly on what it is, how to use that, especially in targeting or building your commercial awareness? Yeah, so I wish I came up with this, but I didn't. <laughs> but it's a really kind of useful tool you can use. Um, it's not perfect, but it's it's certainly really useful sort of starting point. So um, SWOT is sort of S W O T. It's an acronym stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, and this is a really good way to basically analyze and understand a client um, before they embark on whatever kind of legal problem they're going to do. So if a client mm -hmm. comes in and says, "Look, I, what's our kind of current position? What? How are we doing?" you know in relation to our competitors where are we fitting in with our market so you look at their strengths what are they currently doing really well you know take facebook as an as an example i think i use in the book um yeah. you know they've got an, an incredible brand they're used by you know billions of people over the world it's you know they've got a huge platform they've got the opportunity to target ads in a really kind of unique way that not many other businesses can um you know that that's clearly a huge um, strength for them a yeah. weakness i guess would be they've had a lot of kind of um debates and, and kind of uh, scandals recently when it comes to data privacy people are becoming less trusted on the platform the idea of fake news being spread on there um, you know people are concerned about how their information is being processed and so on so those that's kind of an idea of the kind of strengths and weaknesses side of things and then I guess the opportunities mm -hmm. is kind of how you turn those strengths into greater strengths. So, um, you know, what's an opportunity that Facebook could use recently? Well, you know, obviously everyone's at home. Everyone's kind of really reliant on video calling. Um, I think they've already begun, yeah. to, begun to do this, but how can they kind of make video conferencing, you know, more of a platform so they can host webinars and, and events like these? Mm -hmm. um, and I guess a threat would be, you know, something like Zoom taking away a significant period of um, portion of their, their space or, um, you know, something along the lines of, more kind of data protection legislation that would force them to change their business model in some way. So that's a really kind of quick example of how you can go through the different strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, of a company kind of as it stands before you embark on something. Um, and then I guess when it comes to the second part of that, which is PESL, um, which stands for, which is sort of um, an acronym for 
um, P E S T L E. So the political, yeah. economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental factors. So, um, you know, now mm-hmm. that we've understood where this company is and where it's sitting in the market and how it relates to its competitors, mm-hmm. um, PESL is a good way to understand, okay, if we're going to try to solve this problem, what are the different kind of elements of this problem that we need to be aware of? So, um, you know, yeah. is, it could be that some are more important than others, but if we're thinking about political factors, how are other countries um you know reacting to certain things that are going on in the world at the moment is there any kind of um big political shift that is that is kind of underway you know brexit was a good example of that of how political opinion kind of forced through this legislation um you know those are kind of examples of how you would break down a, a problem into its different areas and then um by doing that swat and pestle together you've hopefully got a good idea as to who your client is what you need to look out for when you try and solve their problem uh, and even some ideas as to how you do it that's that's really great. Um, so you're talking about the political, the economic, you know, um, mm-hmm. of course, the structure, the technical part, you know, the legal part and the environmental factors as well. So, you know, having all this, you know, having these bullet points basically just give you an idea as to what exactly to give your client when it comes to advice. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really fantastic because it actually shows that you've done your research, you've done the needful, you've done your due diligence. And, you know, of course, you know how to actually do the needful. So that's really great. Thank you very much. So um, from Comerprit, I hope I pronounced your name. So so sorry if I made any mistake with that. Um, he's asked, what do you think virtual work experience programs at Inside Sherpa can impact um, assessments when I apply for vacation schemes um, or training contracts? So I think we briefly stated that, but if you have anything to add, so he's basically asking how do virtual you know, internships basically increase your chances of actually landing vacation schemes or training contracts? Yeah, so so like I said, I think they're really good for kind of um, helping you learn more about a firm and, and helping you kind of make your decision making. Um, you know, you have to kind of realize that the kind of virtual internships, you know, anyone can do them. So in terms of their kind of, I guess, face value as to... Um, um, you know what a firm will think when they see them on paper it, it will depend on firm to firm but what you will get in terms of your own value is the ability to practice these these tasks and these um, these experiences and kind of have a have a go at reading through these documents and you will hopefully learn something more about law and, and more about what type of things you're interested in um, so like I said I think it's that really kind of good initial point to, to kind of build your knowledge and information and understanding about law and then once you've done them go out and try to speak to other lawyers try to um, secure some kind of legal work experience yourself um or or just try to kind of understand what type of law firm you want to work for so um hopefully all of those factors will kind of help because when you get to um writing your application and you go from that go for that kind of funneling idea like we talked about earlier and kind of telling taking the recruiter to your story um you know you could use a virtual experience as a good example of that you know i tried i first found out about the firm and i tried your virtual experience i kind of really enjoyed these elements of the work and it just kind of inspired me to learn more and then you know go on to detail what else you've done in your journey so um yeah hopefully they can kind of help with the the kind of information provision side of things all right thank you harry for that question i hope that question was answered okay so uh, on to the next one so um this question may actually resonate with you so johnny asks again hi harry for those who do create content Mm-hmm. How do you facilitate discussions in the comments rather than surface level engagement? Um, I notice many of your posts um, have opened ways um, have opened ways for deep engagement. How can content creators try to replicate that kind of level of engagement? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, so, I think it will depend slightly on on how you've built. I mean, presumably, if you have some kind of following or some kind of um, community that you engage with, it kind of depends on how you've built it to date. So um, I guess the the kind of primary thing that I started out with when I started writing publicly, when I started my blog and when I started this podcast um, was the idea of, um, you know, what would I have really wanted two years ago as a resource to help, you know, to stop me making those same mistakes, to stop kind of, you know, stop getting myself confused with misconceptions all those kind of things um i think if you kind of ask yourself that question you'll end up creating something that's really valuable um, and people appreciate things which are really valuable um so i think if you can if you can kind of focus your content on the idea of value and and helping people um what i've tend to find is the more you do that over time the more people will kind of keep following what you're doing um and hopefully kind of stay that that kind of deeper engagement like you say um i also think it comes down to posting things which are not just valuable but are either slightly 
um, interesting or even potentially, you know, controversial. I mean, obviously don't, don't say anything crazy, but um, if you kind of um, give a really unique insight into something or you, you, you kind of tell a bit about your journey or you kind of pose a question to people and kind of want to, you want to kind of talk about an area which um, either splits opinion or just is open for discussion. I think people will kind of naturally gravitate towards that anyway. Um, and then finally, I guess, um, especially on LinkedIn, um, you know, all of that is boosted by the fact that you're already going out and and kind of interacting with other people's content. So um, platforms yeah. like LinkedIn, especially, reward people who who use their platform and and engage with other people's content and and like it and comment it and share it and, and add their thoughts. So you know, from the algorithm's perspective, in terms of how your content shows up, that's really important. But then also just the idea of human connection and actually kind of um, engaging with other people's ideas and, and, and interacting with them is, is really important too. So hopefully that's a, a way to hopefully drive a bit more engagement um, beyond just kind of surface level stuff, like you say. Yes, of course. Um, I've particularly been able to see that. Um, so information that's current, information that a lot of people are interested in at the time, mm -hmm. information that you know that will never run out of style. Uh, those are some of the things you can begin to put and you know linkedin is, is, is built in such a way that you don't have to just dump content um mm -hmm. you can always build a trail of engagement so um that's why different social media platforms have different uses different algorithms and uh, one of the things i understand about linkedin is that um when you post um the more people engage the more the visibility increases so once you're able to capture one person's um attention it's kind of like you know a domino effect a lot of people now begin to see a lot of people begin to engage and before you know you are having almost 10,000 views and of course a lot of comments and for everyone who likes a comment for everyone who makes a comment you know other people in their own network get to see what they're doing so you know it just goes on and on like that and that's how you know visibility practically grows so that's really really great and thank you for that so that leads me to my next question and we are, hope we are almost rounding up so please guys um, if you have more questions, please just put it down. I wouldn't want to take all of Harry's time. I could keep it here till tomorrow, but <laughs> he has things to do. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, so you 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 have a blog. Mm -hmm. You have an Instagram channel um, handle. Um, you also you tweet. You you're also on Twitter, and you've been able to. So, how have you been able to successfully use all these platforms? Because some people may say, um, I'm really not so good on LinkedIn, but I'm a vibe on Instagram. I, mm. I, lo I know how to connect with people on Instagram. I'm, saying, I'm not really, really into pictures and words. I just love to tweet. I just love to, I have sudden sparks of inspiration. So basically, how can you leverage each of these social media platforms to boost your visibility, job mm -hmm. one, and also maybe attract global attention, or global, achieve global relevance, you know, you know, all these things you've been able to do. Yeah. So you said something that was really important in your answer, which is, you know, I know how to do Instagram, for example, I, I, I like pictures and I like how it works. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need to be on every single social media platform. If, if there's one that you really enjoy and that really works for you, um, it probably is, you know, it, it works to kind of go all in on that and to really maximize that one. You know, that's what I did with LinkedIn at first. I didn't get on Twitter or Instagram until a little while later. Um, and it still is today my kind of main platform. Um, but if you're looking to explore others, if you're looking to, um, um, you know, go beyond what you're perhaps used to. I think just trying to, again, go back to what you said, Roseman, understanding how each of these platforms are different. So, um, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram all have different algorithms. They all have different ways that they demonstrate their content. There's different ways that the average user probably likes to consume that that content and understand it so you know you think about instagram it's obviously very visual so you know the kind of how it looks is 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 arguably more important than what it is and um, versus a lot of other platforms um take an idea like twitter it's very conversational it's very discussion focused everything's happening in real time so that's almost like a, a never-ending kind of stream of discussion that you can kind of get involved with um and then something like linkedin is probably just a kind of more kind of I guess, uh, I don't know, formal or kind of a bit slower than something like Twitter because people tend to post, you know, if they do post a lot once a day or once every few days. Um, and like you said, the idea that you can, you know, someone can like your piece of content and it gets shared with all of their network as well is something that's quite, is quite unique with, with um, LinkedIn. So I think when you're just getting started, focus on that one platform that you really like and that you, you either use in a personal capacity already. Think about how you could use it in a business or professional one. And then once you've kind of got to grips with one, um, consider others that interest you and, and hopefully, um, yeah, put it into practice and, and see where it goes. All right. That's amazing. Thank you for that, um, for that answer. And, I believe that whatever platform you, you, you are drawn to, 
you can leverage it, all mm -hmm. right? And you can gain visibility when you're giving value. That's amazing. So I have one last question from mm -hmm. Emmanuel A.G. Okay, he's a, he's a close friend of mine. Um, so he says, good morning, sir. It's great having you here. Please, I want to know whether these internship opportunities are also available for lawyers with interest in human rights and pro bono services. What are the chances for assessing some of this via the virtual platforms? And I think there are any opportunities. Emmanuel Ejim from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So I think, especially with Inside Sherpa at the moment, which is kind of the main virtual internship um, opportunity sort of platform, um, it tends to be quite commercially focused because if you think about their business model, the way it works is, um, you know, Inside Sherpa will go to a firm who has lots of money and say, we will build this platform for you and help kind of draw people to learn more about your firm. And they do that in exchange for a fee. Um, and generally, you know, pro bono services, human rights and, and criminal law and so on don't tend to have as much of a budget. Um, having said that, um, I recently created a sort of spreadsheet which which details um all sorts of different free courses that people can take to learn oh, a little nice. bit more about law nice. i'm going to share it in the chat um just now i hope that works um but basically th the idea behind that is that you can um hopefully go through that spreadsheet um i know there's not loads about um kind of uh, litigation or human rights and so on i'm doing my best to think it what it hopefully does give you is a little bit more about how lawyers think how to improve your kind of critical thinking how to improve your commercial awareness, like we mentioned, business development and so on. Yeah. Um, they're not, you know, those are kind of universal tools that you'll need as a lawyer, regardless of whatever area of practice you go into. Um, and then I think if you're looking to virtually learn more about human rights or something, um, it might not be that there's a, a formal virtual internship, but there certainly will be webinars, there certainly will be podcasts, there certainly will be videos and discussion you can get involved with to learn about them. Um, that certainly make a sort of good alternative for you to, to learn more about that side of law. All right, that's amazing. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, I would love to get that um, that platform for you. Um, yes, no, I just put it in the I just put it in the chat. So hopefully oh, everyone great. can access awesome. that. Awesome, <laughs> awesome, awesome. I can't have access to it because actually I'm. You know, <laughs> that's great. I'm going to click mine immediately. All right. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so the truth is, okay. So so, so let let's break it down a bit. So, um, so some of the things that you've spoken about, honing your story, commercial awareness, understanding the business of law, understanding the business of your clients, um, basically, you know, being self-aware, knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses. So, um, what exactly um, should you basically, um, how, what, what should be your mindset when trying to come, break into, you know, global practice? And the mm -hmm. truth is that uh, technology has made you know, um, law firms, you know, become one, has made people become one, has brought people together as an individual and for somebody who is, you know, basically trying to navigate this almost seeming new path and mm. you're just like, you know, I want, I want to make a difference globally. Mm. I want to impact, I want to do something that's going to make a difference. What kind of quality should I possess as an individual? Just coming from your experience. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the biggest lesson I learned going through the process, I mean, yeah, yeah, there's no hiding it. Law is very competitive. Um, uh, you know, the, it's a very hard profession to break into um, on your first go. Um, and yeah. you know, when you first receive rejections, when you first um, kind of trying to learn more about law and you, you might not be succeeding as quickly as you like, it's very easy to compare yourself to other people and, and where they're at now. And I think, um, you know, there's a, there's a Canadian professor, Jordan Peterson, who, who kind of had a great quote, which I do my best to, to sort of live by ever since I read it, which is um, compare yourself to where you were yesterday rather than where someone else is today. Oh. Um, and I think if yeah. you focus on that idea of um, kind of compound interest of trying to just improve on a small habit or a small area, you know, even if it's just for 15 minutes a day, um, that will add up over time. And I think that's that's a kind of really important way to, to hopefully try to do that. And also, you know, if you compare yourself to other people, there's there's let's face it, there's always going to be someone who's better than you at something. There's always going to be someone who um, can play the violin better than you, can play the piano better than you. And even if you are arguably one of the greatest in the world like uh michael jordan for example basketball um people are always still gonna not have 100 percent consensus that it's you and always kind of have that debate so um no focus on kind of your own journey and your role and how you're going to improve um and then just very quickly the second thing is um i guess just evaluate how you use your time on a day-to-day -day basis um you know it, mm. it was very easy when i was at university for me to to you know waste somewhere between four to six hours of every day just you know 
watching rubbish TV or just like not doing anything productive. Um, and you know, <laughs> if that, if you add that time up over, over a period of time, you know, say five hours a day times by seven days a week, that's 35 hours every week. If you times that by 52 weeks a year, um, and you say that your time is worth, I don't know, $5 an hour, $10 an hour, that's mm-hmm. you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, um, you know, uh, kind of useful hours and, and potential money that you're kind of just pouring down the drain. Um, that's not to say just, you know, work 24 seven, but certainly try to do things which are useful to you, both in a business and a, just a normal kind of life sense, I guess. So yeah, those are probably yeah. the two, two things I, I wish I'd learned a bit quicker. Um, but thankful I've, I've mm-hmm. hopefully tried to learn them now. <laughs> <laughs> and you're making you're doing such a fantastic job um we must really really thank you for a lot of insights that you've shared i believe a lot of people can actually learn from thank you very much no, um so i'm aware about rounding up um <laughs> we're almost close to hours, and i think okay i think we just one hour gone but there's so many things that we can actually we've actually learned in this short time i wouldn't want to keep hurry waiting so I'll just ask one question. I believe someone else has dropped a question. And um, okay, so someone asked, how can one secure? Okay, I think we've answered this question from Ine Chinaza. She asked, how can one secure international virtual internships? Also, how can this help in boosting the career path of a prospective lawyer? So I believe you've already answered that question. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of us already know um, Inside Sherpa. So you can just go to the website. I don't know, um, Harry, if you could help us uh, with the link to Inside Sherpa so that yeah, you can also I'll, see. I'll put that in the chat now yeah. so you're able to find it. Okay. okay, that's awesome. So let me just go to the, I think the last question I have um, before uh, we would have to move on. So, um, so um, basically, uh, what exactly, uh, having interned in some of the top law firms in the world, seeing how these firms are structured, um, what exactly are the international best practices that should be adopted by these law firms, um, that should be adopted by law student trades, future lawyers, and even current legal practitioners in terms of organization structure and being able to actually you know, enhance and boost productivity. The general advice. So, so how should how should students kind of improve for international firms? Did you say? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So and and how law firms can engage. What are some of the international best practices that law firms actually should engage? Maybe in my own country or whatever country people actually so what are some of the things that should be done for lawyers law firm owners and law students yeah so i think from from the student side of things if you're interested in that international element of law um you know i think like we said earlier try to get that global appreciation of how law works think about how businesses function across borders um try to understand how different jurisdictions are different or how different parts of the world are you know specialists in certain areas so if you think about london for example that's kind of considered one of the key kind of financial and service provision places in the world um if you go to california san francisco it's obviously considered a really big tech area same with kind of hong kong japan and so on so try to understand a little bit more about how all these kind of um businesses and and countries and jurisdictions work together and, and get that global appreciation um and i guess from the firm side of things i think the reason they 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 kind of look for um this kind of international element is because like we said so many clients nowadays are are multi-jurisdictional or you know a legal problem won't just be in one country it could be that um you know uh, a supplier in one country say america um has a supplier from china and there's some kind of issue um you know you've got two parties there in different jurisdictions and and there might be all kinds of different legal questions as to how that contract was drawn up that is going to be really kind of important um so yeah i think that's kind of that and then i guess another kind of thing which is slightly related to this question is i get a lot of questions from international students basically saying am i at a disadvantage um applying from an international background or, or anything like that and i think um like we said going back to the idea of kind of telling your own story and trying to sell to the recruiter why why you're there um i think it's really important to try to think of your own international experience um as as kind of a unique selling point so you know are you bilingual that's a huge thing to have on your cv because a lot of lawyers will uh, sorry a lot of law law firms will, will would would really treasure something like that if their clients are kind of based in different areas and um, you know have you worked with a, a, a huge diverse array of people you know can you kind of espouse the idea of diversity and inclusion and kind of help build that collaborative culture um you know do you have this global context of how different jurisdictions work i think those are all kind of examples of, of potentially um you know kind of examples of you could put on cv that are good selling points for your application um 
And I guess if you if you're looking to learn a little bit more about kind of um, the kind of qualification process and things, there's a really good platform called um, Global Lawyers Connect. I'll put it in the chat. Um, you can find them on Facebook. You can find them on okay. LinkedIn and Instagram. Um, they I, I'm part of that, and they do a really good job of kind of breaking down. Um, all these different mm-hmm. elements of what it means to kind of go from one country to another when it comes to trying to qualify and, and hopefully leveraging your application. So hopefully that will help with Habib's question as well, um, which he's just mentioned. But yeah, no, that, that's also a really good resource. All right, thank you so much. I, 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 I you know, I think knowledge is, is gold in this in this new age, and you've been able to share some of these sources. And of course, if you also want to get global opportunities, please also visit HarryClarkLaw.com because you will also get a lot of content there. You know, um, you'll be able to see a lot of um, things that basically affect each and everyone. And it's actually quite amazing because you know, going through the website, I think, I think, I think you, your content is such that it's easily relatable, cuts across board. So you don't have to say you're just in one jurisdiction. You, you understand because you talk about things like knowing how to negotiate, you know. Um, so um, so um, Chidima asks, is there a need to write and pass bar exams from different jurisdictions? I think that is possible. I don't know you, what your answers are to that. That's a question from Chidima. Um, yeah, for you to be able to qualify to practice in these jurisdictions, do you have to write and pass bar exams for those jurisdictions? So each jurisdiction will be different, but generally I guess the, the kind of average answer is yes. Um, like I said, if you go on that Global Lawyers Connect, they try to break down um, some of the different resources by country so you can learn a bit more about the kind of qualification process to practice in different countries but um as a general rule you'll need to pass some kind of formal exam unless um you've already qualified in your home country and you have a certain amount of experience and that is considered kind of sufficient but for the for the most part um generally yes okay all right so I think that also answers the question that um, Habib Akin Benu asked mm-hmm. because um, I think he talked about uh, considering multiple bar qualifications. So also also have that at the back of your mind. So for the very last question, um, I will be able to attend to. Um, um, Johnny says, following up on the issue of internal commercial awareness, are you able to share some insights about what we should be aware of about Baker McKenzie? Um, what are some of the key differences between international firms like Baker McKenzie and domestic firms or maybe local boutique firms? Sure. So, so I, I actually got that question a lot in the last month or so when people are starting mm. to kind of research the firm because I think applications are opening soon. Um, and what I did was I, I spoke to the firm. I got a panel, I think about four or five of currently practicing trainees who are currently working at the firm and essentially ask them all the different questions that students often ask. So what makes Bakers different? Um, um, you know, what is it like to actually be a trainee solicitor on a day-to-day basis? Um, what is it you do enjoy? You know, have you done some comments? What, all these kind of questions um, and, and kind of live streamed it. So if you go to my YouTube channel, if you just type in Harry Clark, you can view the whole live stream back. Um, all of the different questions are timestamped. So you can just click on the things that are interesting to you. Um, and I guess, yeah, I guess the reason I'd kind of forward you to that is because I'm, I'm yet to start working there, but these guys have been working there for a while and they've all got different answers and different experiences as to why they applied and why they like it. And so hopefully that will kind of really help you um, distinguish it between other firms, like you say. So yeah, if you head over to my YouTube channel, um, you can watch it back there and hopefully um, answer some of your questions as well. All right, that's amazing. Uh, we just have a comment before I would have to round up here. Um, so this is from Rachel Purvis. Thank you so much for this comment. She said, I attended the webinar last night, hosted by the law student. It's Association of Nigeria. We heard from that your personality is your business card. With which, which has resonated really with me and I see just illustrated in yourself, Rosemond and Harry. So thank you very much for that comment. Um, that's really, really appreciated. Okay, thank you very much. So um, any last final words before we go? I, th- I think this, this is this just in one hour, we've gotten so much knowledge. So <laughs> I don't know if you have any formal comments, but I am out of questions. But what I have to do now is to you know, put this knowledge to work. Um, I mm-hmm. always say um, knowledge acquired that is not being dispensed and used is just knowledge. You can't translate it to anything. So um, I would definitely share the links, share the ebook after this webinar. But well, I don't mm-hmm. know if Harry, you have anything to say before we actually sign up. Yeah, no. Um, thanks for having me. I hope it's been useful. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you're wanting to learn more about what I do, um, 
like I said, go to my website, you can sign up to my newsletter, um, or you can find me on most social media, at Harry Clark or Harry Clark Law. Um, and if you're lo looking to learn a little bit more about law practice generally, um, feel free to listen to the podcast. It's called More From Law. You can find it on Spotify, iTunes, and also you can listen on my website if you don't have any of those as well. So hopefully those are all good examples of, of resources to try out. Um, and yeah, and finally, I guess just don't just take my word for it. You know, I've had one perspective. I've had one um, way of doing things. I've had one journey and one background but you know you could ask a different lawyer from a different country or whatever and they'll have a completely different set of um advice and a kind of evidence to give so really try your best to go out there and speak to people and, and learn as much as you can because there's only so much i know um and it's certainly nothing in comparison to what a lot of other lawyers will know so hopefully that will um help you guys um in the sort of beginning stages of, of learning a bit more about law Okay, um, I'm, I'm so excited about your future, Harry, because I know that the sky is just a starting point. Um, I can't <laughs> wait to see you grow on yourself. Um, when you start September, mm -hmm. you know, um, I will definitely be keeping in touch. And I know that um, it's going to be a beautiful um, working experience um, from now henceforth. So thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. I see everyone's comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Um, so just a tiny introduction of myself. My name is Rosemont, uh, host of the Younger Mentorship Series. This series basically is to encourage young lawyers who are basically you know, looking for clarity, looking for direction, and meeting up with as many persons who are global thought leaders like Harry. Um, we've had a lot of people come up. Um, we've had Modica Adejo, we had Frank Ramos come on, and um, it's really, really been an exciting experience. I can't wait to see you guys again. Thank you so much for your comments, and that will be bye for now. Thank you, Harry. Um, Thank you. So we definitely send um we definitely send all the materials that are needed to as many persons who basically registered, and I would really, really love to connect with you even after now. So that would be a goodbye from me on my end, and thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Have a very, very good time. Is everyone bye? <laughs> All right, bye.